So, uh, uh, actually, the Okahabra lady got a whole few weeks ago. some sort of situation that might be able to counteract it. We ask that you be with us tonight as we go through this business. Give us calm hands, cool heads, and a heart that will listen. And we pray, Lord, that you will be with us who are up here. We don't walk on water. Our middle initials are not God. We're just people who love this town and the people of this town. So give us a good common sense and let us think our way through things and use the wisdom that is needed to make the decisions. I ask this in your name. Amen. Amen. And we stand before the Pledge of Allegiance. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Texas flag. I pledge allegiance to the Texas, one state under God, one nation. committee 
uh, that hears those various requests. In general law type A cities, they're the only cities in the state, in fact, that have the ability, if I'm not mistaken, uh, where the Board of Aldermen, the City Council, as some may call it, has the ability to wear the second hat of the Board of Adjustments. So what you're about to witness is a Board of Adjustment hearing, not a Board of Aldermen hearing. There is not some surreptitious effort underway in this community to bypass the Planning and Zoning Commission or to bypass the Board of Aldermen. It is set forth in our code, it's set forth in our statute. What happened was sometime back we received a request for a building or for a building permit for a fence uh, in the downtown area. And specifically, it's on the property that we commonly refer to as the Ramble parking lot area. Ramble being no more, it's now Rio, and we're excited it's going to be Rio, a brand new restaurant that's coming in. That particular permit application was to install a fence along the side of the property line that's adjacent to what's commonly referred to as Peddler's Alley. And that fence would also go across the portion of the back property line. Our code of ordinance, our zoning code, allows a side fence, a side yard fence, if you will, to go along the side of a property line up to the front of the building. But it cannot extend beyond the front of the building that may exist on the property. And in this particular case, the applicant is seeking permission to extend the fence approximately 12 to 12 and a half feet into the front yard of the property. There's not proposed to be a fence across the front of the property. Again, the fence we're talking about is a side yard, partial rear yard fence. But I want to clarify something because I think there's some strong misinformation out on the street. And that's not uncommon. It's not unique to Salado. People start talking. We're not here tonight, this board is not here tonight to discuss the validity and the legality of the fence that is proposed. The only thing they are considering tonight, the members of this board are to consider tonight, is the various request. And the various request only relates to that 12 and a half foot section that extends off that fence. If the applicant wanted to right now, and we would issue it right now, a building permit to build the fence along the side of that property to the front of the building on the property and along the back end of the property, we wouldn't issue the permit for that 12 foot extension because that's not allowed by the code. Hence, they're seeking a variance to see if they can get permission to extend further towards the front of the property line. So that's all they're here tonight. So know this in your comments, your comments need to be restricted to that extension because that is really all the board is here to pass judgment on. The conditions. A lot of you may not understand when I talk about conditions. This isn't a good old boy system where they say, you know, I like them, we're gonna go ahead and grant the variance. It's a statutory process. The decision of the Board of Adjustments cannot be appealed to the Board of Aldermen. The only way a Board of Adjustments decision can be appealed is in court through an action. In fact, I will tell you, if you're ever asked the most powerful board in city government is not necessarily the Board of Aldermen, it is actually the Board of Adjustments because they're a quasi-judicial board. So they have, they have to meet certain conditions, just like a judge. When he rules or she rules on a particular case, he's obligated or she's obligated to look at certain things and check the box to make sure they're met. There are several things they're supposed to look at. Should the Board of, Alder, or should the board of Adjustments desire to grant a variance, the board must affirmatively find the following conditions exist. Number one, there are special circumstances or conditions affecting the land involved such that the strict application of the provisions of the ordinance would deprive the applicant of the reasonable use of their land. Second condition that must be affirmatively found, and that is the variance is necessary for the preservation and enjoyment of a substantial property right of the applicant. Third, granting of the variance will not be detrimental to the public health, safety, or welfare, or injurious to other property within the area. And fourth, granting of the variance will not have the effect of preventing the orderly use of other land within the area in accordance with the provisions of the ordinance. Now in addition, when granting the variance, the Zoning Board of Adjustments has a couple of other things they must consider and rule on. They must make written findings that an undue hardship exists using the following criteria. A hardship must exist. And the criteria for the basis that they have to make judgment on is number one, that literal enforcement of the controls 
will create an unnecessary hardship or practical difficulty on the development of the affected property. Number two, the situation causing the hardship or difficulty is neither self-imposed nor generally affecting all or most properties in the same zoning district. The relief sought will not injure the permitted use of adjacent conforming property. And then granting of a variance will be in harmony with the spirit and the purpose of these regulations. It's important to understand that a variance may not be granted to relieve a self-created or personal hardship, nor shall it be based solely upon economic gain or loss, and it also shall not permit the person the privilege of developing a parcel of land not permitted by the village's zoning ordinance. So those are the conditions they have to look at. It's not who you know. It's not who looks good, who looks bad. It's not, well, I owe you this. They have this as a basis that they must make a determination on. They can consider public input from anybody. And I think they've already received some comment in writing. And I'm sure tonight they'll receive some comment uh, orally here at this particular meeting. Briefly, this is the area we're talking about. And if you can look at the map that's up, Again, that area that's in green is a legal fence, and we're not here to talk about that. That is the proposed legal fence. What we're here to talk about is that very small blue strip, which extends approximately 12, 12 and a half feet to the north, basically to the edge of the building, not to the sidewalk, but to the edge of the building, the adjacent property. So with that said, the applicants will have their opportunity to stand up and make their presentation. Mayor, I will tell you that we've received a request that uh, the applicant would like to make an initial presentation, but they would like to come in after all public comment and follow up uh, and, and answer any questions and try to close their case, if you will. So with that, I'll turn it over to you to open the hearing. Well, Don, let me ask you a question. I have uh, here comments that have been filled out. Uh, do they want to come in after these comments, or do they want to come in after the hearing? The procedure typically is you let the applicant make their case, and then you open it up for public comment, and then the applicant comes back in and makes closure and responds to any comments that may come up and closes their case. So we have, <clears throat> with the applicants at this time, uh, let me do it this way. Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to ask Don questions concerning what he said? This is the question time to ask him. <clears throat> okay, if there are no questions then, applicants. <coughs> Mayor, Alderman, um, the partners of Rio Salado have asked me to present. Uh, this variance request because of my experience on the Planning and Zoning Commission. I'm familiar with the variance process and the regulations and the seriousness of a variance request. I think you guys know um, in other situations on the PNZ I've denied variance requests uh, rec or recommended denial and you guys have approved them and um, you know I, I trust your judgment and Whatever y'all decide tonight, um, it's fine. Um, but I, I want to go over the reasons, the justifications that are specific to Section 53B2 and answer any questions that you have. Jay and Graydon and Tricia can also help me answer some of those questions. Um, if you would, uh, go to the next slide, Dawn. Uh, I want to speak to this illustration that helps us see what we're looking at. Um, Rio Salado is going to be a Tex-Mex restaurant at 109 Royal and we're utilizing this space as the parking lot for that. We've engineered this space to hold 77 parking spots, a massive improvement from what we have had across the street. And so for that to work, um, it takes well, you're an engineer. <laughs> you know, it, it takes some very specific requirements and using that space as efficiently as possible. Um, what I want you to notice looking at this photo is the rear view of the commercial building that faces Main Street isn't that attractive. There are air conditioners, mechanical equipment, electrical boxes, propane tanks, 
this building and these businesses have faced Main Street for years and it's normal for a business to have this kind of mechanical equipment on their rear side. What's not normal is it for it not to be screened. Um, any other, in any other situation, this equipment would be screened. But because of the history along Royal Street, it just hasn't happened and there hasn't been a need for it. Um, but what we're trying to do is improve the aesthetics and maximize the potential of not only the Rio Salado property, but the adjacent properties as well. The other thing that's unusual, oh please go back, if we're gonna be here for a minute. The other thing that's unusual and unique and a justification for this variance is over the last few years, those Main Street facing businesses have pivoted their entrances to face their back alley, to face Royal Street. However, they have not moved that, that mechanical equipment. So, you know, you have doorways and signage and mechanical equipment that is honestly unsightly. It's um, not what I want the customers that are coming to our business to see. Our goal is for people to come to Rio Salado and from the moment that they get out of their cars, experience the beauty of Salado and part of it, that starts in the parking lot and it starts with their views. Our plan is to maximize this space for its parking, its safety, the accessibility and the aesthetics. So speaking of accessibility, um, we are installing a sidewalk along the um, along the right of way and what this fence and particularly what the variance is going to allow us to do is ensure that people and the, the foot traffic is going to that sidewalk so that they are accept, you know accessibility is ensured safety is ensured it'll just be so much better um, and you know maybe I should have started by talking about our neighbor, Mr. Foster, is he here? No. Thank you. Um, we met with Mr. Foster yesterday and had an excellent discussion. And I don't know, um, I know he talked to Dawn, but I don't know if it was updated in your paperwork. Originally, this fence uh, variance request was for a seven foot fence. And after talking with Mr. Foster, we've agreed to, for the fence to be under five feet which he believes uh, will be fine. It will not be detrimental to his property or his tenants. And because of that, he is not in opposition to this variance request. And we are determined to work with Mr. Foster to ensure um, communication continues and that the good of the whole South Side is ensured. Um, Think, oh, the other thing I want to point out here is that if this were Mr. Foster bringing you this request or wanting to build a fence in the same location, he could build it to where we want to take it. He could do it. Um, so if you would go to the next slide, please. Um, we, we have to ask for this variance because of the unusually large front yard that Rio Salado has. I think it must have gone back to the time when it was used as a feed store, maybe, and it made sense to be set off the road so much, but it's highly unusual. And um, it's, you know, if, if it was, again, Mr. Foster wanting to build a fence, um, he would be able to take it to the point that we're taking it. From this, perspective, you can also see uh, where we're going to put the entry and exit of this parking lot. And I just mentioned this because having a controlled space there, which we will do one way or the other, um, is, is going to increase the safety of this area so much. And that extra 12, 12 and a half feet of four and a half foot fence, five foot fence, um, it's it's going to allow us that extra little bit of space right there for how many extra parking spots? Oh, two. 
two. Okay, <laughs> y'all know it gets busy down there, and you know everybody wants to park. Um, and so, uh, I want to say that the ordinance is written to apply to a normal neighborhood, uh, to a normal development, not one that was historically a feedlot, uh, and not one that pivoted its entrances from Main Street to its alley. This is highly unusual. Um, and so those are some of the extenuating circumstances that we believe justify this variance request. The other thing is, and kind of where those cones are, um, that's basically where the sidewalk will be, and it will lead around to the handicapped parking that will be against the Rio Salado building. Again, increasing accessibility in our sweet village. Would you go to the next slide? Hello. Um, I'm standing where the fence, where we've proposed that the fence go to in line with Mr. Foster's building. Um, I'm about 5'6", uh, so the fence will be around my shoulder or lower, and um, if you follow that line, you can see it's going to screen the unsightly air conditioners and the propane tank. Um, and at this angle, it, it needs to come out that far, otherwise you would be able to see those things. Um, and so I also want to show that you can still see the doorways, you can still see the neighboring businesses signage, and they still have full access to that driveway. Um, you know, there are deliveries happening in Peddler's Alley. We're not interfering with those deliveries. Uh, what we are do is we are preventing those large trucks from abusing the parking lot. Uh, go to the next slide, please. And this shows what we began with on the top left slide. That slide, you know, there's a history of that lot being a dumping ground and large <coughs> trucks uh, going in and out of it. I know like TxDOT has used it. You know, everybody kind of parks their gravel trucks there, and it's really just created potholes and a, a terrible condition, which we're already working to improve. Uh, and uh, let me see. You know, historically, this space it hasn't been pretty. It hasn't been something that we're proud for our visitors to see, and it hasn't been safe with rebar and you know equipment and it, it just hasn't been good and the variance request that you're considering helps us maximize its potential its potential for safety accessibility helping direct people to the sidewalk that we're installing and it definitely helps with aesthetics and it helps maximize the potential parking um, and just for the record, we're planning on landscaping and adding safety lighting, cameras. It, it will be lit up and just a massive improvement. Not that it has to do with the variance. Um, but if you would go to the next slide, please. Uh, these are examples of horizontal wood fences with up lighting and landscaping uh, that we, you know, of course those are too tall. Ours will be lower. Uh, but uh, this slide hopefully covers all of the, the notes I've made and I um, think we've addressed the requirements for the variance. I've also given y'all a handout with this presentation in paragraph form that goes into a little more detail and that's the end of my presentation unless one of the managers has something to add. Jay Rich, and uh, I would like to go back and emphasize um, the reason that we're we're asking for the variance for this 12 and a half foot section. Um, the parking lot layout that we have submitted to the village incorporates three lanes of diagonal parking. And quick math will tell you that three lanes is an odd number. How are you going to get in and out? We're doing that by sending people 
from Rio Salado along Royal Street and then turning them to the center. And we're sending people along the backside against Glassworks building and turning them into the middle. So we're doing this with our parking lot. What happens in this first critical turn is we're going to be we're going to be turning against that fence. That fence sets the property line. And if we're using quarry block, then that's a two foot loss, just a, in the physical loss. But the natural tendency of people when they see a quarry block is to turn even harder away from it because it's, it's threatening. We would much rather have a, a friendly looking horizontal wood fence that's only going to take six inches of of property to install and leaves us an additional room to execute our turning lanes. That's that was uh, the main point I wanted to bring up. Why we want the, the 12 and a half foot extension. Do you have any questions for us at this time? I might have a question. Could you go back to the first slide, please? This one. Okay, if you're, if you're in your parking lot, and I understand about seeing the mechanical equipment, but when the fence is put up minus the 12 feet, you won't see that. If you're looking straight out of your parking lot, you're going to see that brick stone work on that building. You really don't see the mechanical equipment unless you're standing in that building, the northwest corner of the parking lot, then you'll see it looking up that way. So I, I, I don't see how the 12 foot is going to block anything. <coughs> And then your comment, Jay, about the parking. Yeah, I understand about the tight turn, but but if you if we did not grant the variance, that would give you two ways to get in out of your parking lot. I think, in my mind, and you will lose maybe six parking lots. I'm, I'm not I'm not following. Okay, two 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 means of entries. Right, you have so you have a twelve foot entrance. You have two entrances to your parking lot. We can't enter our parking lot from Bedlars that way. That's a private driveway. <laughs> that's, that's private property. Okay. Um, so and people coming down Pedler's Alley couldn't turn into your parking lot? No, sir. No, sir. We, is, that's not something we would want to impose on another property owner. That would, increase, that would increase the amount of traffic that's coming through Pedler's Alley if we did that. The um, other thing I'd like to point out is the 12 and a half foot extension while acting as a site block from the point that this perspective is taken all the way up until you reach the point that Katie's other slide showed where she might mark the corner, that isn't just a site block. That's also channelizing pedestrian flow into the sidewalk. That keeps them from cutting through a parking lot. And at night, having people coming through the parking lot is something we want to try to avoid if we can, or at least minimize, so that we aren't mixing a lot of pedestrian traffic and cars backing it out of spots. Other questions, please? I have one more question. Sure. So coming down the front along Royal Street, is there a little cement blocks going to be as well today? I'm sorry. All, all the, the limestone blocks I saw today, those are going to be in front. They'll be spaced in the front. The, they'll be spaced in the front, and the intention <coughs> is to protect the, the um, sidewalk. Once we construct the sidewalk, there's angled parking on the right of way. We want to keep people from pulling up onto the sidewalk. Not only would it block the sidewalk, but it would physically damage the sidewalk. So that, that acts sort of a, as a uh, traffic stop. But it's spaced out so you can still walk between. So again, if we, if we did not grant the variance, we would have possible people walking out of Chupacabra or whatever the building is behind you into your parking lot, cutting the corner and obstructing traffic with cars. And that's the main. That's one of the main reasons for the variance. Stop people from coming into your parking lot on foot. That's that's one of the reasons. Yes, I wouldn't say it's the main reason, but. It certainly is one of the reasons. Is it also to protect children from trying to climb on the blocks and jump into the alley? Yeah, but... Yeah, the kids are not 
other kinds of debts. We, we don't want to encourage people to hop across stones and cut a corner or something like that. We've already got that condition and we want to minimize it. You'll see that we, we are blocking with stone block in the yellow indicators to turn the corner, but that's because that's the compromise. You, you don't want to extend a fence past the front of the existing building because right now we're still 40 feet from the edge of the pavement. And uh, to extend the fence further towards the pavement would start to become a point of diminishing return as far as safety and visibility goes and limiting pedestrian cut through. offer a solution. You brought something up interesting, Katie, a little while ago. If Morris Foster could legally build that 12 and a half feet, could you not just ask him to come in and ask for a permit for that 12 and a half feet? Yes, and we have several options, including that one, if this doesn't go through. Well, it'd be much easier on everyone if that were the case, because he can legally come in and do the permit. It doesn't have to come to the zoning board of adjustment at all. We don't have to make that decision. Well, that's, that's an option that we, we're not aware of until you just mentioned it. But if he would be the one to come in and ask for the permit to complete that fence, there wouldn't have to be a variance at all. He has the legal right to put the fence there because it lines up in his backyard with the side of his building. That corner of his bed. It's effectively the same thing. I understand that, but then we don't have to do a variance that ultimately we have to question all the points on the variance and we really can't get there. At least I can't get there on that part. But Mr. Foster can come in and ask for it. There is no variance involved. What what issue do you have with the variance with our request? Can you speak into the microphone so we can all Which hear? which points aren't we addressing? I don't think the variance, not giving you the variance, is going to deprive you from the use of your land. Yes, we're going to gain a couple of parking spots, but it doesn't deprive you from use of that land. Deprives me of maximizing the potential of my property. Again, if you remember what he said, we're not here to talk about the economics of this. That can't be. A, a I'm not. I'm not. I'm talking about aesthetics, and I'm talking about safety. And you can't deny a fence is safer, safer than quarry blocks. It's not blocking any views. The adjacent property owners are not in opposition. Let me make this pretty. Other questions, please. Now, Katie, have y'all, uh, I know you visited with uh, Mr. Foster, he's the owner of that uh, area over there, but have y'all visited with occupants to see if you could uh, work out a deal or, or a friendly, uh, agreement that we all can support so oh yeah I've talked to two of the tenants so far a third tenant launched a social media jihad uh, and I probably shouldn't talk to her sorry um, but you know we are very friendly with those tenants that we have approached and as far as I know they're not in opposition of this variance request One tenant has been very vocally opposed, um, and so that's that's worth mentioning, and I'm sure you'll hear from those people tonight. Have you sat down with those people and, and tried to uh, work through this? And just I, I would really rather not. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, I, <laughs> you know um, I think that some of the tenants were misinformed, and that misinformation was spread across social media, causing even more confusion. And instead of people coming to us to ask us for <coughs> clarification, uh, they didn't. Uh, my husband reached out to a particular tenant with our intentions, said if you have questions or concerns, call or write. We, we got no response, and earlier this week, we were attacked online, and um, it's not fun, and I'd rather not deal with that. Uh, so I'm really, really happy to have a relationship with Mr. Foster and be able to work with him in a proactive way that makes everyone happy. Any other questions, please? 
Thank you. Since the public hearing and also these flight sheets of paper that I've got, which are fill out if you want to uh, talk about a situation, they're all the same. So let me make this really clear. I'm going to start. I'm going to call the hearing together. And these are going to be the first people that will speak because they did fill this out. Now, to all of you that may want to speak, let me make some things really clear to you. You're speaking to us. You're not speaking out there. Secondly, you have three minutes. Mike, will you be our timer today? I've got a volunteer here. She's going to be our timer today. Okay. Thank you very much. Three minutes, we will stop. No clapping. No shouting. None of that. Say what you've got to say, and that will be it. We are listening very carefully. We take notes of okay. the first ones, these right here speak. We cannot respond to anything like this. We can't. But when the hearing and these three go, or four go, then we can speak, but not with this. So, with that being said, we're coming out of this session. Madam Secretary, the time is six minutes after seven. The hearing, and these are the people who will speak first. Sean Miller. Sean Miller. Uh, my address is 21685 Stillman Valley Road. Uh, it's a clean address. We do live out in the country. We don't live out in the clean. This is what y'all know. Uh, just to give you a very quick background, because I've got a very short amount of time. Uh, I'm a retired police officer. I was a police officer for 32 years. I worked for Weatherford Police Department for 20 years. I worked for TABC, which is the Texas Alcoholic Beverage Commission, for 12 years. And I worked for Salado Police Department for a month. And if it hadn't been for a 2,000-pound bull that decided to use my back as target practice, I'd probably still be with Salado. But uh, Rachel Moore reached out, uh, and excuse me, Strong, excuse me, I'm sorry, Rachel, reached out to me and asked me if I would like a job, and I took a position as manager at Chupacabra. Chupacabra is located, I guess, yeah, everybody probably in town knows where it's at, but behind the fence there. Uh, we did... You know, initially I was like, why would, I asked Rachel, why would somebody want to build a fence, just a privacy fence along one wall? And now I just got an answer. I didn't, I didn't know why you don't want that. It's to not look at air conditioners. I mean, it's okay. Well, I get that. Uh, then they're going to fence it off. And honestly, if you take it at face value, what they're doing, it seems to me that if you don't want to buy a taco or a burrito at their nice restaurant that's coming or during the beer at their establishment, to me, it's cutting off business from at least a dozen different people by blocking this parking lot off. It doesn't matter. They bought the parking lot, they can do, I guess they can do what they want with it. What I don't understand though is why a privacy fence right there, and I look at all the different things that can or give a negative impact of a privacy fence going there, and it's, I'm gonna run it down real quick, uh, but, uh, Auto and pedestrian traffic concerns, ability to operate business as usual, and I'm, I'm not going to go into specifics of these things because I don't have enough time. Critical activity, even in the town of Salado. Safety to patrons and employees at night, EMS and emergency vehicles having access, negative impact to the local economy, negative effect on public events, aesthetics. I don't think it's very good looking, but okay. Historic society. This is a historical town with a lot. I mean, this is one of the oldest towns in Texas. And when we start doing that, building fences like that, 
and granting that, it's gonna, they're gonna start going up everywhere. I think it's, I think it's an eyesore. Uh, other than the, what we were just given on the air conditioners and the mechanics of the business, there's really no benefit of that fence. And in general, it's just not Salado friendly. But I'm gonna look at it at 20 more seconds. No? Okay. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gary? Pardon. Gary, please give your address, please, and your name. Gary Burton, I live at 819 Indian Trail. Uh, based upon the information we gave here, looking at the fence, I had to change what I said. So we're really just talking about the barrier. It's the only thing I really have to say is I certainly didn't see where the three things you pointed out that were legal requirements in order to allow a variance that were stated in the presentation. Uh, and in some of the things in the presentation, they talk about equipment vis visibility from this vantage point, that extra 12 feet provides nothing for visibility. Uh, it's certainly not gonna negatively impact the business they have over there. Um, and then, you know, the parking spots, there are other options besides a 12 foot privacy fence. I just don't see that. Four and a half. I'm sorry. Some of us don't follow the rules, but Go ahead, sir. So I won't take all of my three minutes. That's all really I have to say. Because the things I was going to say earlier from Don's presentation, obviously, uh, were not necessary since we <coughs> only have to argue here about that 12 foot section. Thanks, Gary. Please don't do that again. He filled out the sheet of paper because to do and say whatever he wants to say. Rachel Strong.
and I have discussed this with an attorney, and if I have to do this, I will pursue some legal action, which I do not want to have to do, because it's not good for anybody. And I have not done anything to anybody for them not to come and address it, and I will gladly cover up those air conditioners if anybody wanted me to. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Jay, did you want to speak again and fill out one of these sheets? Yes, thank you. You're welcome. So we've talked about uh, safety, and again, I'd like to emphasize, uh, because some of the comments have strayed to the totality of the films, that what we're talking about is a 12 and a half foot section. And from a safety standpoint, that 12 and a half foot section it does not limit visibility further forward or to Royal Street than the existing building floor. And because the fence is only five foot high, it is much more visible than the existing building floor. The current parking is, is unregulated, it's undefined. What we're trying to accomplish is to set a standard inlet and outlet so we can regulate the traffic flow into the parking lot now. Right now, before we had blocked off for improvements, you could pull through a set of parked cars right into Royal at any point you found a space. And it's unregulated. You could go in and park in any fashion that you could fit your car in. We're working to change all that. Now that has nothing to do with the 12 and a half foot extension that we we're talking about, but because safety has been brought up, I wanted to make sure that it was clear that what we're doing is improving the overall safety of the operation of that parking lot. I don't believe that a five foot extension of 12 and a half feet is going to impact EMS access, police visibility into that alley. Those are my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. The next part is I'm going to do three things. Number one, I'm going to first call. That means if you want to speak, you do exactly what they have done. Walk up to the microphone, your name, address, three minutes. Then I'll do it about when no one comes up or whoever comes up and no one else is coming up, I'll do this. Second call. That's, if you have to get your courage up, then there's an answer right there. And the next one it will be, will be the third and final call, and that will be that. So, it's up to you whether you want to speak or not. You've got three minutes, please. First call. For anyone who would like to speak. <clears throat> Good evening. Uh, my name is Chris Lillibridge. My wife, Laura, and I own and operate Quail Ridge Pocket Beagles uh, uh, at our place on Quail Ridge. Um, we have a lot of people who come to our home to visit with us about our dogs that we raise. And uh, we routinely send them into town to dine at the restaurants in town because, of course, we love our town. That's why we moved here. Um, we love this place. Uh, we do caution the people that come to our town in the evenings when they depart, uh, specifically about this area, because it is so dangerous right now as an unregulated parking area. And it seems to me, uh, as a rancher, we have 10 cattle, we've got 24 beagles, we've got uh, 62 sheep. We're working pretty hard out at our place, and uh, this takes all of our energy. So when we're trying to get people in and out of our place, and send them into town, we have to really caution them about this area because it is dangerous. And I would like to second Mr. Rich's comments about it being unregulated. It seems to me that everything that Mr. Mr. Hill and his wife have touched in our town have benefited everyone, either directly or indirectly, myself included, and my wife and our family. And uh, they've done it to a level that I don't think anybody else would take it to. And it seems to me as a variance or a 12 and a half foot section 
when they're talking about both maximization and funneling pedestrian traffic in a safe way to a sidewalk and making a parking area that's safe for everyone with an egress and entryway, it seems to me that we should consider that in a positive light. In light of everything that they've done for our community, it seems to me that the pictures that they show, I'm absolutely certain they've made good on that. I think what they've done with the brewery is absolutely beautiful. I think what they're going to do with this restaurant and this parking area, if you grant this variance, it's going to be, it's going to be wonderful for our community. And I think more to the point to safety, because I was a former fireman before I joined the Army. If I know that area, and I know where the cars are parked, and I know where they're lined up at, then I know where I can drive my truck in and out. And I won't have to negotiate park cars that are parked every which way, mud holes, sinkholes, broken rebar sticking out of the ground, and concrete blocks everywhere. As you can see by the pictures, they've already <coughs> sunk a tremendous amount of capital into this facility to make it better for all of us. <coughs> Thank you for letting me speak. Bring the first call. Second call, for anyone who would like to speak. Hi, uh, my name is Ellen Burnett, and I actually live in Belton just across the dam on um, Whisper Trail. So we're like half a mile from the Salado District. Uh, but my husband and I come to both establish all of the establishments. We go to the building that's being blocked and we go also to Barrow and we frequent these places often with our children. Um, we like to go to the creek, we like to go to the candy store, we walk up and down and across Royal. Um, I guess, I know this hearing is about the variance, but I personally have questions about the parking lot itself. Um, I know you were talking about the flow of traffic in the parking lot, and I'm having a hard time visualizing that because it does play into the variance. So if, when they come back up to address, if they could expand on that, maybe give a better visual, talking about where cars are gonna be turning in and out of. Um, and then also, I know we can't talk about the use of the parking lot, um, but that is something that I wonder, as somebody who frequents all of the establishments, you know, we often do what's called a traveling dinner with our friends in Salado, where we'll start at the stagecoach, and we'll have an appetizer, we'll have a glass of wine at Chupacabra, we'll hit up the pizza truck at Barrow, um, and how is that going to affect where, will this affect where we can park? That's just a question I have for the business owners, so um, if they want to address that. I know it doesn't play into the variance, but I had a couple minutes to speak, so. <laughs> um, that's really all I have to ask and say, um, not trying to take sides one way or the other, not that issue but I do I do not see where the points that Don brought up at the beginning were approved so if that could be expanded a little bit as well. Thank you. On your second call if anyone wishes to speak now is the time. Judy Fields, 818 uh, Blaylock Circle, Salado, Texas. As a citizen of Salado, I'm very concerned that there's so much contention about building a fence in the historical district. I was a certified dispute counselor for Beaumont, Texas, Jefferson County for eight years, and have spent many hours listening and assisting situations and making decisions which benefited the parties in making these uh, with personal and business issues. The process was mandated by judges who preferred this method as a first uh, attempt for resolution as it keeps court costs down as well as helps to clear their dockets of issues that tend to bog down in their courts. The decision was final and it was taken, uh, allowing the parties to participate to be in control of resolving their issues. Only when the problem could not be resolved by personal meetings of these parties did the, car, did the case go to court and was the judge made the final decision as to what was going on. I highly recommend that the disputing parties have a meeting with a neutral monitor on neutral ground to resolve the concerns of the proposed fence with the variance requested by the original party. Either party can have attorneys present or not, their choice. 
Having sat through many hours of discussion revolving such issues, I know that this procedure works, benefiting everyone concerned, soothing hard feelings, saving court costs and time. The cost of holding such meetings, because I was a volunteer, was $10, and it went to the court, to the county, and is well below the cost and frustrations of a lawsuit. I strongly urge both parties to get together and to try to peacefully resolve the fence issue to the benefit of everyone, especially in the citizens in this precious city that we have, the little village of Salado. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> we are still for the second call for anyone who would like to speak. This will be the third and final call. Anyone who would like to speak? I come back up? <laughs> yes, sir. I wasn't quite through. <laughs> I'll talk real fast. Uh, once again, uh, I told you before I work for Texas Up on Beverage Commission. Sir, we're over here. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I wanted to talk to everybody. Uh, uh, being employed from there a lot of times because I was there for 12 years, you think like a TABC agent. One of the things that you're responsible for, whenever you have a licensed location or licensed premise, is reporting any breaches that occur. And Texas Alcohol and Beverage Code states that the breaches or any disruption through EMS, fire, or police, we have five days to report it. If we don't report it, it's a pretty significant fine. It'd be easy for barrels to see and monitor their parking lot because they're not putting the fence right in front of their in front of their business. They're putting it on the back side of a business where we would be responsible for reporting those things, those breaches. So it's just another, it's one more thing that uh, to consider. And putting the fence even at the variance at that level would still possibly block view for many criminal activity. EMS, fire, any, any activity that needed to be reported by law. Okay, thank you very much, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you. This is the third and final call for anyone who would like to speak. Cover, but I just, I'm a Slater resident, I live in Mill Creek, been here for like 18 or 20 years or something like that. My name is Eric Hawkins. Um, and I know both parties. Um, Katie's treated me really well over the years. Um, Rachel's treated me really well over the years, and I know everybody. And I kind of just want to resonate with the other ladies a per second ago. Just like, I wish there was a way for the parties to get together. You know, maybe come to some financial agreement or something else, but energetically, it just doesn't quite feel right to me. And I remember it was Kathy's Boardwalk um, when you had the um, the e-bike, uh, Lone Star e-bike, in that that um, plaza there. Initially, they were supposed to mirror Kathy's Boardwalk, <coughs> and then something happened. There's some dispute, and then they ended up building their strip part in the opposite to their back. And energetically, just the flow of that was very abrupt, and it just felt wrong. I don't think it felt right for the for Salado. It just detracted energetically from our community, and you know, that's my only concern. I, 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 you know, Kitty knows I meditate. Rachel knows I meditate. Like meditation is just a, a part of how I get through life right now. And from my perspective, the village has been through so much with the expansion of the 35. We lost a lot of our businesses. Now we have all the stuff going on Main Street. And it just seems like it'd be better if we can find some way to work together. Um, I've been to Barrow many times. I've been to Chicago many times. I mean, they're really synergistic. I see customers that, you know, hey, you want some craft beer? There's a craft beer right across the corner. Oh, hey, you want to try some bottle of red wine? Here, there's one right over there. You know, or, or there's one at Stagecoach, or there's one at Alexander. I mean, I've referred to so many people, I was in the military for uh, 24 years, and I've referred to so many military people to all these businesses right here, because I look at all of them when I'm to thrive, and it seems like working together is a lot 
easier way for communities to um, thrive and work together. And, uh, there's some just I don't see any big competition actually. I own a fitness gym in uh, Harper Heights, and there's plenty of other fitness gyms in Harper Heights. None of them are competition to me. Um, I'd rather work with them than against them. And um, I'm not saying it was working against each other. I'm just saying I wish there was a way they could arbitrate or come with some financial agreement or something just to kind of make things so everybody's happy on all parties. And that there's not like a, a flow blockage of the energy of people that you know, we might into our community to go from one business to the next to the next to the next. Because there's ample business for everything to, to flower and prosper. So um, just kind of want to throw that out there. That's the feeling I have about it. I think a mutual agreement would be far better. Thank you, sir. Third and final call is a session. If anyone else would like to speak, please come forward. With no one coming forward, the hearing is closed. The time, Madam Secretary, is 7.31. We are now going to go back into the regular session of the Board of Aldermen. No, sir, you're, you're still in the session of the Board of Adjustment. Oh, I okay. should. Katie, I'm going to give you the opportunity since you brought this to our attention. You may come up and I'll ask the Board of Aldermen if they want to ask you any final questions. So the public comments included that I didn't ex explain our justifications to them. I handed that to you um, written out in paragraph form. Um, I can read it if you would like me to for the public's benefit. Do you have any questions for Katie? Katie, would you be opposed if we chose, and this is just my thought right now, I don't know how the rest of the board feels, so any more adjustment, if we chose to postpone this, for two weeks to see if you could work something out with Morris? I have worked something out with Morris. But I've I lowered the fence. I'm <laughs> that if Morris came in with you to apply for the permit oh, for that 12 and a half feet, then we don't have a variance in place. You've got two property owners that are cooperating with one another on that fence. And we're not putting a variance on top of Mr. I don't believe, I'm sorry. I don't believe that given the construction timelines is going to is going to impact our operations. Um, I don't want to drag out everything that's happening in the last three days. Uh, you know, we're, we're taking a beating uh, on social media that we're choosing not to not to try to engage in a, any great depth. But uh, I don't want to drag that process out. But if we do have a working relationship with Mr. Foster, and since we have not asked him to apply for a permit to build a fence, I don't see what harm it would do for us to ask him that if the board wants to give us some time to talk with him. Thank you. Any other questions, please? Mm -hmm. uh, my question is to Don. Is it? Sure. Don, if uh, this is disapproved uh, today, is that permanent, or can they come back in and reapply with, uh, with Mr. Morris? <clears throat> What's your, if, if you disapprove it, you're disapproving, you're disapproving the variance application that they have submitted. Uh, it does not preclude them coming in at some point in the next couple of weeks with Mr. Foster to build a, a 12 foot extension on his on his property line. Uh, so it, it would still leave that door open. It wouldn't be on their property line, it would be on his property. Correct. Are there any other questions? <laughs> I have a question for you, Doc. Until they are totally out of order. What if we didn't do anything at all? What if we give the people, I mean, we've got, we've got people who have a lot of good comments and almost 200 signatures on a different subject matter. I just think it's, uh, I think it would be prudent to let this just cool off, let the people talk to one another, 
and come to a different solution over here. And the question is? <laughs> just don't do anything, not at all. Make a motion to stop. <laughs> Listen to what the people got to say. Yeah, the parties come together, some great comments about talking this out. I think if we go down the road with this, it's, it's going to be trouble. And I don't know how to explain it any better. Well, well, just repeat that to me. Don, is, am I thinking right? Or is that, do you agree with him? Just ask you. It's that, got to be a question. Okay, Don, am I thinking is that? <laughs> I mean, we, we've heard a lot of good points tonight. We really have. But, you know, I don't know if this is going to be resolved by writing the variance or not. I think we're headed down the wrong road. So you have the right to approve it, provided you find all conditions in an affirmative fashion. You have the right to disapprove it. In either case, yeah, I got all this. Stand by. In either case, it's important that you state the reasons behind your action, behind your decision. Just don't take a blind vote. You can table it to give them time, but if you table it, it needs to be date specific to bring the variance back. You can ask the applicants. If there's a willingness to withdraw their application to try to work something out and then to bring it back if they're unable to do that to the point where the board can make a decision. If you choose not to vote on it, it's probably no different than a no vote. Sure, so you need special circumstances or conditions. Uh, we have a Main Street facing business with its uh, <coughs> mechanical equipment and that has pivoted its main entrances without pivoting all of that mechanical equipment. We have a parking lot, which Jay can explain for Ellen uh, better, that maximizes this space for everyone. It's safer. It, directs people towards a sidewalk. It, the next thing it has to preserve, the or it's necessary for preservation and enjoyment of a substantial property right of the applicant. I should be able to use a parking lot as a parking lot. That's a right of a property owner. And I should be able to maximize the potential of that lot, but it's okay. Um, offenses and error or profile of in quarry blocks allowing us to have a seamless, cleaner look, uh, better aesthetics. The granting of the variance will be detrimental to public health, safety, and welfare. You know, the others have cited some concerns, and I think a lot of those are based on a seven-foot fence. We've come down under five feet. So um, I, I don't see any issues with lines of sight, uh, but I do see that my property that I'm insuring and maintaining is protected, and I think that's a property right. Katie, I hate to interrupt you, but the question is, we've heard all of that. Is there anything in your writing here oh. that we've not heard oh. that you would like to present? Hi, Wallace. 
Um, the, going through the notes, the the thing I want to point out is that um, we have been in conversation with the adjacent property. That conversation started as soon as the adjacent property owner was insulated. And uh, we, we discussed a lot of different options and we settled on a compromise uh, in, in doing less than what we are legally allowed to do and, and building a shorter fence so I don't think it would be a, a genuine position to say that uh, we, have, we have not been operating in good faith and we've not been having discussions with the adjacent property owner. I think the, the, uh, the other side of that coin is there's a very strong opposition to anything that we're doing with the fence, much less a 12 foot extension. That opposition is not coming from the property owner. Okay. Thank you, Jim. Can I ask a question? Sure. What's the, the capacity of the Frio to whatever the building is going to be? The projected capacity to 130? That includes the patio area. 130. Y'all, I mean, our feelings are going to be hurt. You know, you have to look at this and see if our justifications are worthy. And y'all know us, and not that it matters, but you know, we're not gonna do something that's detrimental to any business. We are cheering every single Slato business on, sending people to them, rooting for them, appreciating the services that they provide that maybe we can't, or, you know, I don't, we have nothing against these businesses if that is a perception. We just want to make this safer. We want to use this parking lot to its full potential. But if, if the justification isn't there, we understand. So it's okay. Make your decision and um, yeah. Thank you very much. Make your decision and we're gonna keep working on the property. It's, it's underway and we're gonna to have tacos soon. <laughs> That's the back side of the shirt. <laughs> Not correct, but I think it's unfair. Rachel? Yeah. I would give you um, three minutes if you'd like to say something. They have said theirs. I don't really understand why they would think that I'm in opposition to talking to them because nobody's come to talk to me. Nobody's asked me anything. The social media thing was in um, in response to some negative social media, them getting on and saying, I'm the reason the fence is going up. Um, I just want to keep it to this. That is not within the special circumstances of what the law says or the ordinance says for special, um, for variance. And it is detrimental to my business. And this is a really odd angle of this camera. If you were standing on the street, you could see my back door from right here. This is um, it's a smoke screen um, to be able to cover up my business that they feel is somehow in competition with them, which it is not. I do something totally different. And um, Sophie's building's been tried to be broken into. The museum's been um, broken into. There's people walking around Salado with Uzis or whatever they're called. And safety is a huge part of it. And I don't see where um, a big wooden fence is more safe than a block. I don't. It's more safe to be able to see around you. There's kids running back and forth. There's, there's moms pushing strollers. There is nothing safe about that fence. 
and it's not very historic either. Um, and you can say you're going to do whatever you're going to do, but the, at the end of the day, once the variance is granted, they can do what they want to do. And that's been done on multiple occasions. Thank you very much. You're Rachel. welcome. Any questions that you'd like to ask? This is the board gentleman um, that you'd like to ask to Don. Is there anything that needs to be cleared up? I'll entertain a motion then, please. I'll entertain a motion, please. I make a motion that we deny the variance request based on the fact that it doesn't meet the hardship requirements needed uh, to approve this and it would create a precedent to the city to allow um, future requests to be made and um, step on what has already been put in place for our ordinance. Is there a second to the motion? Second. Motion has been made and seconded. Now discussion. So I have a question to Bill. Okay, so the reason I asked the, the um, occupancy question is this. Because I didn't realize how big the occupancy was. Now that I'm seeing that, I understand the need for that much parking. And I'm unsure of how else you would meet all of because um, it looks like, I mean, it's pretty tight the way the parking lot's designed in there. Being able to physically have enough parking for a full house. So is that something that you can consider as a, you know, a hardship? I think unless they're telling you that they have to have the extension to meet their required parking, then you know, I, I think it, it's an interpretive question, but the, the concept of hardship is there's no other way to do what they want to do. And, and that's probably the simplest way to put this variance process, even though you have to be specific on the conditions. I'll give an example. We want to put the house in the setback because we have a 300 year old oak tree that in order to put it where it needs to be by code, we're going to have to take that out. That's a hardship. That, that's a natural condition that they're trying to preserve and protect. So there's the basis of the hardship to go into the setback. In this situation, from an occupancy standpoint, if, if they were at 76 spaces now, or they're at 76 spaces, and if you don't give them the extension, then that takes them down to 73, and they need 76 to meet, then, then that might be the basis of that. that you've got to, it's, it's got to be tied. You have to prove the hardship. So can the and it hardship can't be self-imposed. And then the other thing is, can the hardship be, like Katie mentioned earlier, the setback of the building itself be an, kind of a, an odd setback on the lot? So like they constructed the building, they just bought it that way. It would be your interpretation. It can be as you see it, as you read it, as you interpret and believe it. Uh, Any other discussion, please? What prevents them from planting a tree there? Nothing. Or planting a bush? Absolutely or nothing. Edges. Absolutely nothing. They have the ability to landscape it as they see fit. Any other discussion, please? I'll entertain a call for a question. Question. The question has been called. All in favor of the motion, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. Mayor, you vote as a full member. John. My motion is to deny the variance based on hardship not being met. I concur with that. 
This is what democracy is, just like this. And I thank you for your spirit, for your words, and for a fine, Katie, for Rachel, for a fine answer to this. Thank you. Consent of the agenda. Approval of minutes of the regular board of Alderman meeting of February 20th, 
going to the public or pay a motion. Please be approved.
here just a brief presentation on an item that uh, is all over the news right now and I think is a, is a significant concern Mary you can mention it in your opening invocation and that is uh, the coronavirus disease 2019 COVID-19. Uh, we have asked Kathy Brown who is the public health preparedness coordinator for the Bell County Public Health District to come tonight along with Jean McKeska who is the chief epidemiologist. We've asked them to give us kind of a brief update on uh, where the county is as far as the preparations for dealing with this particular situation. They might be able to give you a little bit of insight into the virus itself. Uh, at the same time as I recognize them as they work their way to the podium, uh, Dave Broker, I don't know if he's hung around, he, there he is in the back. Dave is, is your representative on the Bell County Public Health District, and uh, I think we owe Dave a round of applause for his service. He's been on the for a Thank you very much. Uh, is it Mayor Blanston? Do I have that last name proper? It's one fine for every skip. Okay, every so honorable <laughs> members of this Lido community and Mr. Ferguson, I want to thank you tonight for inviting us here to, to brief you on updates for the coronavirus. It's, it's been in the news, it's been on everybody's mind, and there's been some nervousness across the United States regarding you know this particular item. With me tonight is my colleague Kathy Bram to my left, who is the head of our preparedness and the director for the preparedness and epidemiologic section for the Bell County Public Health District. I am the chief epidemiologist. I've been watching this thing very carefully as it unfolds. I've also been in communication with our partners across the county, which include hospitals, emergency management, and city officials. One thing I'd like to point out as we get started is you do have a packet with some brief information in it, and I'm not going to be speaking word for word from that tonight because it will take too long. I'd like you to think about the flu. The flu every year is contributing to anywhere from 25,000 <coughs> to 85,000 deaths across America. And we don't hear that much. We don't think about it much. But when we think about it in comparison to the coronavirus, we've only had 146 cases in the, in the United States and 11 deaths so far, okay? The flu, by far, exceeds any other disease out there as far as these uh, bugs that cause illness and death. So consider that in context. When we think about the coronavirus 19, or COVID-19 as we call it, what is it and why is it important? It is a bug, similar to the flu, but of a different class of of virus, okay? What's interesting about it is it's novel or new. So it's not been in humans before, and we really don't know how it's gonna interact as it spreads across the United States. It says, as it spreads, because there will be a time and a day when it's in our communities. Our objective, though, is to minimize that and prolong that so that we can have uh, vaccines developed for that, and treatments as well. Okay, so when we think about that COVID virus, you have symptoms similar to a common cold. However, it may impact certain people who have uh, what we call in, in the medical field comorbidities. What that means is like diabetes, respiratory problems, or maybe you're being treated for cancer. It would impact the aged people and others with comorbidities more severely potentially than those who are healthy adults or healthy children, okay? Um, and so that's one of the big things, is that when you hear about 11 deaths, most of all those deaths are associated with people with comorbidities who already have failing bodies in one way or another, okay? How does it spread? Well, coughing, sneezing, and those respiratory droplets that are out there and get on surfaces or when people cough into their hands and shake your hand or grab a doorknob right after coughing into their hand. Those are the ways that it spreads. A person coughs and another person walks by. It can enter the nasal passages, land in the face, and then people would rub their eyes or their mouth with their hand and that's how it spreads, similar to the flu and other viruses. Okay. Currently, we have sustainable spread in geographic areas like Korea, Italy, China, Iran, 
but not here in the United States. What we mean by sustainability spread is that it is easily spreading from person to person fast. Public health methods are slowing that down here much more readily than other places. But let's face it, we have the greatest health care in the world here. We have the greatest capability to respond to something here beyond anywhere else in the world. The other thing is, is that we're not stacked on top of each other. Texas is a big place. We like our elbow room. So we're not shoulder to shoulder with everybody all the time. So when we think about distancing ourselves from somebody six feet, that's about six to 10 feet where you want to stay away from a sick person, right? So if you see somebody going into the grocery store coughing and sneezing ahead of you, what do you do? Give them a really wide berth, okay? So we want to enact the things that we can do as individuals, as community members and businesses, and as leadership in communities. What are those things? Well, as individuals, we have a responsibility that when we're sick, we stay home and get well. That we don't feed our children Tylenol and then send them to school anyway. Because we know they're gonna share whatever they have with everybody in the classroom. Just because we take Tylenol and our fever goes down does not mean we're well. And we need to remember that as we go about our lives. We know it's inconvenient to be sick. Nobody really wants to stay away from work, right? And least of all, no one wants to have to stay sometimes when their children are sick. But for the benefit of our friends and neighbors, we should probably think about the consequences of being sick and sharing that illness with others. So what can we do? We can cover our cough and sneeze. Good sneeze and cough etiquette, right? Stay home when you're sick. Stay away from sick people. Wash your hands frequently. And, yeah, I know, there's, there's a time significance here. My boss is kind of saying, yeah, this is right now, hurry up. What can we do as businesses? Okay, at home we can also clean our horizontal spaces and keep our home clean with Lysol. We could do that in business as well. We can increase the cleaning of frequently touched services like door handles and push bars or places that would come up to reception areas. We can clean those with antiseptics, okay? We can also have good policies for sick leave for people. When people are sick, we don't want them to come in and share that with all the people in the building and all the people at our work sites because it, they can kind of cripple a, a business by doing that. If you're a food establishment, you're supposed to be excused anyway when you're not well, okay? So as businesses, we can have those good policies in place that are friendly to our employees as they are the number one asset that a business has, okay? So good policies. What can we do as community, as community leaders? Well, we work together. We dust off our plans. We speak to our emergency management coordinators. And then we plan for trigger points in our planning that would allow for us to start um, closing things when they need to be closed or canceling things when they need to be canceled. We are not there, ladies and gentlemen. We don't want to do knee-jerk reactions to something that can harm your community. As your public health officials, we're not going to recommend those things until it's absolutely necessary. Okay? So don't shut down events if you've got an event planned, unless they're sustainable spread within a community nearby or within your community. So we want to think about the things that we can do. Those are the things to do. Live your life as normally as possible, but be cognizant of the things that individually we can do, that we can do um, it with our businesses, and the things that we can do as a community to curtail the spread, because it is coming. But we can prevent it as long as possible. It will be here, okay? But so is the flu here. And the flu every year, kills 25 to 85,000 people in America. So we live with these things all the time. We just kind of get scared when something new comes around. So I'd invite you to give us calls when you have questions, communicate with each other, and do what we can do individually as ourselves, by washing your hands, covering your cough, and staying home when you're sick. 
as well as having those other things I mentioned. Thank you, and I'll yield any time. Any questions? I have a question for you. Yes, sir. According to the map that you passed out, I've been down in Central America a lot. How come it's not down in Central America? Uh, they just haven't got it down that far yet. Or they're not it's reporting. Or it's just a reporting issue. As Kathy mentioned, it may be a, a reporting issue. Not everywhere has a really great public health system to detect and report and prevent. And so you may not see um, things actually as they are, such as China probably has a whole lot more cases than they have actually told us about. You probably heard that on the news too. Ladies, do you have any more questions that I can answer? Thank you very much. And thank you for your time. We are your health department and are glad to work with you in any way to you know, work with plans and prepare your community for the eventuality of the coronavirus coming. We just hope it's much later than sooner. Thank you. Very quickly, we want to let you know that uh, we're going to be coordinating with them to hold a public meeting, a community meeting, uh, that uh, we will certainly uh, leave a few days to advertise and to communicate and to try to uh, get a good population uh, at that meeting so we can spread more information. I guess the one question I would ask very quickly, and that is, I, I know one of the questions nationally that, that's hot as of 6 o'clock tonight, and that was the future availability of tests for it. And you know, from Bell County's perspective, how do they allocate those to counties, through health departments, working through the medical community? Uh, how does that work? That's a good question. Uh, so just this evening, um, the Austin State Lab uh, came up online to do uh, what we call testing. Uh, but it's pre presumptive testing. It'll have to be um, backed up by a secondary test, or what we call final test, at the Centers for Disease Control. So they have the test kits now in Austin. They're able to test. We also have LRN labs, or neighbor labs, that help us throughout the state of Texas. Three other labs that I'm aware of are also testing. But depending on where you are, that's where your sample goes. In this area, ours goes to Austin. So when we have patients that need to be tested, the way it works is if they have a history and if they meet certain criteria related to coronavirus, they contact the health district. The health district works with our, our regional and state partners to um, basically grease the rails to kind of help that process occur. Okay, and then we make recommendations to the health providers on what to do with the patients and how to send the patients where they need to go as well. Okay, typically patients are asked to self-isolate during these times of question when we don't really know if they have it or not. So that we ask them to self-isolate, which means go home, monitor your symptoms, and stay away from people. Okay, self-isolate. That's part of that social distancing that we talked about. When you don't have a treatment or you don't have a vaccine, we do what's called uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, which are again, the hand washing, the social distancing, um, and things like uh, eventually, if it's really bad, uh, you know, closing certain large gatherings. But we're nowhere near that. And those are some of the things that we have in our tool bag to be able to, to help our communities through this process. Thank you. Thank you very much. I heard almost exactly the same speech you just gave at Fort Hills Day. Oh, did you? I probably should have borrowed his notes. It was exactly the same. It wasn't done by you. It was very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you guys again. Thanks for your time. I'm glad you got an opportunity to see what Soledo democracy is. Oh, it's wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Thinks you want to get a virus, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> no. Soledo, please report. Dave, while I'm uh, Dave Broker, while I'm waiting for Pat to get up here, I want you to know how beautiful that chapel is that you that you built for us. It is very, very nice. Thank you. Good evening. Sorry, I was just telling the Board of Health guys that your department's registration is expired. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we treat
two years. I mean, two years. All right, calls for service last month were down to 26. We had 502. Uh, we're on 37 citations. There, that's up from last month by 30. And uh, we, uh, out of those 137, we're 85 with warnings, so 62%. Uh, I have 13 offense incident reports, 17 supplemental reports, uh, five crashes, and two warrants issued. Uh, three arrests last month. Uh, priority one, two, and three calls. You see, we have a distribution there. Calls for service can stand on about the same that we've been over the last several months. Distribution of our traffic offenses, citations, and so forth. We've got crashes, we just can't predict those. Our response times came down almost a full two minutes, a little over two minutes. And again, uh, came down a little bit on priority twos and threes as well. Uh, did 151 house watches uh, during the month of February. Uh, that's down 159 in January. It was a busy month with uh, people going out of town for the holidays. So. That's it. Very good. Questions? Quick, so. Questions to Pat? You sure? Well, all, right. All, right. Thank you. all right. Thank you. Nice job. Thank you. Well, Shane, your turn, Mr. Fire Chief. How are you tonight, Shane? Hello, how are you? Good.
being a person to settle in a bit. Uh, Viz, your guys are out. Um, you have one in front of you. I'll talk a little bit about it um, in a minute. I've been working with uh, Spring Event Planner, which you'll also hear about, about in a minute, uh, a little bit more about. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on this spring, a lot of exciting stuff in the village. And then I've also been working on designing group marketing material, which goes along with some of the changes we made on the website, uh, focused on weddings and, and groups and things like that as the stage coach starts to get more in, more meeting space to add to our existing meeting space. Uh, we want to be prepared to market the groups and, and uh, show them how we can service them when they arrive in the village. Uh, this is just a quick overview of the traffic on our website. You can go to the next slide. Um, it's uh, 4,000, 200% increase over um, uh, February of 2019, um, which shows that uh, it was kind of, you can't attribute it to one specific thing. It's a combination of our work on social media, um, our our ads, and then also uh, some search engine optimization that we've been working on on the back end of the website. Um, and then on the visitor guide, uh, you will note <coughs> changes from last year's guide. We have a lot of a lot better imagery, which is what we worked on. Slides is a slow process. We had to do imagery with the first budget cycle. We had to take photos, um, and now we're able to actually use those photos this year. And so we've got better imagery, expanded information, we added more pages. I think in the future you can even add more pages. It just depends on um, how far you want to go with the visitor guide. Um, a more informative map that has more landmarks on it. Uh, consistent design that's uh, consistent with the visitor guide to the website uh, and everything else that we're doing. Um, and and uh, I think it looks good. I've gotten a lot of good feedback so far. So more, it's more or less the same as last year, but expanded and improved. Um, and then upcoming events we've got, uh, of course, Johnny's Lone Star Music Series is starting uh, the third week of this uh, month, and it'll be monthly until about October. Uh, Northbound Down Music Festival, uh, I think it's the second annual, second or third annual uh, festival is happening uh, down by the creek. Uh, fourth Friday, Wildflower Arts and Crafts Festival on that last weekend in April, I mean in March. And uh, the Texas Wine and Rogue Art Fest had actually been canceled this year. Um, but Wildflower is still happening. The Chamber is still putting that on. And at Fourth Friday is still happening. Uh, in April, Packer Clubs return to Salado. Uh, that's an exciting event for everyone. Um, and then a new festival at the Barton House. I had to convince there that there's really, truly a lot of events going on. So this is the uh, highlights. And then the last weekend in April is um, Fourth Friday, the laser show that I think you are going to discuss um, tonight. And then a new uh, concert slash festival called Sounds Over Salado that a concert promoter is putting on here, bringing in some relatively large bands uh, and doing a lot of marketing to bring people to Salado for that con uh, concert. So that's exciting. So that will be taking place at Barrow's? That's correct. Barrow Brewing is not putting it on. Um, they, are, they are the venue for the concert. Um, but I can answer any questions about that. Try to. Questions to Chandler? Uh, I would like to refer you, if that's okay, to the um, the Salado Winery. Um, it was that canceled. Thing? It was canceled over concerns about the virus, and I think they did that out of a step of precaution. Their decision. I think our fears were not as it is now, but as it will be during the, when the event takes place. Okay. Um, expecting more cases, more fears, things like that. So along that same line, then about this sounds like a story. Um, I don't think so. Uh, as we just heard from uh, the public health district, um, there's no real uh, reason to be extremely concerned right now. Um, it is a conversation that I know the, uh, that the chamber has had. I think they had the conversation this morning about the coronavirus and what they should do with their event. And they made the determination that they're going to continue with their event. And South of Salado is the same, same as far as I'm concerned. Those are decisions, John, that they will consider as they as the events get closer uh, and, and as more comes out about the virus and its spread. So uh, at this stage, again, everything's on board and everybody's moving forward. Chad, I want to thank you for all that you've done. When is your last day with us? April 4th. Uh, yeah, April 4th, Saturday. I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, you have really worked hard here. We ought to just give you that red 
golf cart because everybody else is going to drown it. <laughs> and you work very closely. And I, I really thank you for that. Yeah. I really do. So, uh, we'll see, Don. Third person. Thank you, Chairman, for everything. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, here we go.
we need to stretch our legs anyway, but I want these guys to look good like you. Vital Village Voice just donated a hundred dollars to them. You got your first hundred right there. And we can send checks to Don. Is that correct? Send them here, we'll give them to him. Absolutely. Okay. We're going to help. Not, in, not in my name. Thank you. Name? No. Actually, actually we'll, we'll put it in his name. Okay. And he'll lots those in his name. Right. We're proud of you. Thank you. I'm glad you're going to the neighborhood camp. Okay, now then, discuss the possible action. Discuss and consider possible action authorizing the village administrator to execute a contract with laser spectacles, spectacles to perform a laser light show for the Salado Art and Cultural District on Friday, April 24th, 2020. Doctor? Hey, this is the project of the uh, SCAD, the Salado Cultural Art District. Uh, as you know, we are the face of that district in the eyes of the Texas Commission on the Arts. An application was submitted by the village uh, for funding of a laser light show that will take place on the Friday night before the sounds over Salado. And uh, it is scheduled to uh, take place the exact date you see in your packet. Uh, the grant uh, application sought funding to uh, cover a significant portion of the artist's fee. Uh, and we have received notification that uh, we will be getting uh, a grant somewhere in the neighborhood of about $1,650 to go towards the cost of, uh, of that fee. Uh, there's some other costs associated with this particular event uh, that they're going to be trying to cover through uh, in-kind donations. Uh, there's an obligation, for example, to put up the, the artist overnight. Uh, there's an obligation for a phone, a lift, those type of things. Uh, you know, some speakers, uh, and I will tell you members of the uh, Art District Board are working feverishly to uh, get those items donated if at all possible. Uh, so what we're proposing here is, is to set the path for the ability to sign the agreement when the grant is approved. We anticipate the grant being approved by the Texas Commission on the Arts on the 12th of March, and then we will execute the agreement with the artist and proceed accordingly. Uh, it's going to be an interesting event. Uh, if you've ever seen one of these, it's pretty spectacular. It's not something where they just have a bunch of flashlights. These are high-powered lasers, and actually is a design show. Uh, so our recommendation is that you grant us the ability to authorize the agreement. Uh, those costs not covered through any kind of donation or contribution will come out of the hot fund and the arts portion of the hot fund, as we talked about. Questions to Don, please. Yeah, Don, uh, how much of, uh, of this $10,000 will eat up our hot well, we're hoping that we're not going to be spending much at all uh, out of that fund to go towards that ten thousand dollar contribution. But if it does, there's clearly there's not enough the arts allocation of that fund as we generate some one hundred and forty to one hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. So we're about ten percent or less than that would be used for this, this live show. And, and 
that's if we have to use it. The concept is we're going to try not to. And then the second uh, question I had is on page two of the agreement. It says that there is uh, inclement weather or another adverse condition uh, that uh, will uh, cancel the show, that there will be a compromise. Uh, it's written as the, uh, the parties will arrive at a compromise on reimbursement. So uh, if there's a if, if weather's bad and it's canceled, we're out ten thousand dollars less the uh, uh, the grant. We're what we would try to do is we try to obviously work with the artist to reschedule it if at all possible in the event of that. That's that's kind of the intent I believe with that section. Yeah, I'd like I'd like I'd like to see that uh, tightened up if we could. We like a 50-50 agreement, seventy-five <coughs> something like that. Absolutely. We obviously are not going to be able to negotiate the grant funds. We're not going to be able to give the grant funds, and you know, when there's a there's a completion requirement for the event for the grant funds. So, absolutely, you're, we can type that language for you. Other questions to Don, please. I'm going to take a motion. We present uh, as presented with the addition that uh, the village administrator puts in uh, some wording that uh, defines the uh, compromise in more detail. Is yes, there a second? Second. Must have been made. Second to discussion, please. Question. Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hands, please. Opposed, likewise. Passes. <coughs> C. Discuss and consider possible action authorizing the village administrator to contract with Extraco Technology to provide technology services for the village of Soleo and amending the fiscal year 2020 general fund budget to reflect the expenditure for such work. Ron? Mayor, we, we've grown as a city over the years. We have been uh, blessed to have had the ability to leaned on a, a gentleman with another community who is uh, involved in their IT department. And that individual has kind of served as a volunteer IT specialist for the city and has, has dealt with the, the various uh, technology issues we encounter. We're not a very robust operation when it comes to technology. Uh, we're not real technology heavy, but we do have a network. Uh, we do have uh, computers that operate to part of our daily operation. And we do have issues that we have, uh, obviously issues of concern related to security and those kinds of things. That we all do as communities today, especially uh, at this time. Uh, the individual who we've used uh, at no cost for the village uh, has, has become over time uh, pretty difficult to uh, obtain on a timely basis when we have an issue that may pop up, uh, be it an issue with email, be it an issue with our network, whatever. Uh, and so in discussions with that gentleman, we've decided that uh, maybe we need to take that next step. And that next step is to, is to actually bring in uh, an IT firm to, to kind of serve as a, a true contract uh, information technology firm that will handle uh, pretty much all of our operations as far as IT goes and also give us the capability of additional needs uh, should we need those uh, relating to building the networks and those type of things. Uh, we uh, talked to some providers uh, as a result of our research uh, we've arrived at the recommendation and our recommendation is that we uh, consider contracting with a group called Extraco Technology. Uh, Extraco Technology is an interesting organization that's been in existence for many years. They're used by many communities in this area. Uh, law enforcement, uh, not just law enforcement, but also cities. Uh, they handle and are responsible for the IT responsibilities for those communities. Uh, we envision uh, the needs uh, as, as follows, and that is uh, we think that they would be able to provide us with phone and remote support and on-site support. They'd be able to provide some firewall support, uh, wireless network switch support, structured administration, uh, they also would be able to install service packs, updates, dark web monitoring, offsite backup, uh, vendor liaison support. Uh, they'd be able to service our workstations, obviously, uh, as far as antivirus updates and those type of things are concerned. The monthly cost for these services, which would be regular services provided, would be in the neighborhood of about $1,292.50 a month. Uh, there would be a $500 one-time startup fee uh, to get them on the ground. Uh, if we have other technology needs, if we decide to build the network further, if we decide to do some additional wiring, we talked about video wiring for this room, or looking at maybe some cameras in the community, uh, you know, those would be built separately. Those would be built on an hourly basis under a separate agreement with them. Uh, we think they've got a lot of skills. We think they have a lot of experience. They have insurance, uh, and uh, 
their track record is very good as, as, as we check them out with a number of their provider, a number of their, uh, their uh, contract uh, entities. So that said, uh, that's our recommendation. We do have representatives uh, here today. If you'd like to stand up and maybe offer, introduce yourselves and, and offer any comments you may, you may have. Good evening. Um, my name is Patrick Johnson. I'm the president of Export Technology and I have one of my technology specialists here, Peter McNeil. Um, we'll be happy to answer any questions you guys may have on the proposal or anything in general about our company. Are there any questions that you would like to ask? Uh, I have quite a few questions. Um, Don, you mentioned the upgrade. Is this just going to be for this building, police department? It's, it, this, this building, the police department, and the PC we have in, in tourism. Okay, so the fire department and the office of tourism would be on this building? Tourism would be, that was the PC I mentioned that we have now. Okay. So the fire department, the fire department's a separate entity. Okay. So we're, we're looking at $20,139 a year roughly, to have this. So, and then I read through the brochure, and it's, it's, it's really nice. And, but, so what, what's this really going to be? It's, uh, well, most businesses or cities nowadays, they have to have some sort of IT professional protecting their system that's familiar with their setup, that knows the programs that they run, and basically protect their data, and keep the, the network safe from cybersecurity threats. And this, uh, a firm like us, is a more cost-effective alternative than hiring your own IT professional. Okay, so, do you, do you, are, will you just, see, we have something happens to our network, okay? And then, of course, you respond. Yes. Okay, what would that would be for response? Well, I mean, if your network's down, then we would be we'd be dispatching somebody immediately. That's just how we operate. I mean, we kind of people basically engage us at a kind of a high, medium, low type of priority. Uh, a network down is going to be a high priority, so we're going to be dispatched out. There may be somebody trying to troubleshoot um, if they can get in the system remotely to try to identify things just to get things up and going quicker. Um, or if, as far as if the network's down, then somebody's going to be coming immediately, even if we have to pull uh, technicians off the other <coughs> and all these other accounts to come. And to be routine checks with the system oh, yeah. the year and not just waiting for something to Right, yeah, I mean, we have robust software that basically monitor, monitors the network. We have d separate software for the police department because they're CGIS compliant. They're regulated by that entity that has, that has to be basically, you can't just have anybody into that network on that side on those computers because it's different data, um, police type data, then they have to grant us access to get into that. <coughs> Any training required to do any kind of this new network? Um, I mean, all our guys are probably 10 plus years experience. <coughs> <coughs> oh, you mean as far as for us to come into the, to use the system? No, not at all. I mean, it's, as far as engaging us in support, is that interesting? I mean, they can call us, they can email us, we can set up our system, they can enter in support tickets. It's kind of whatever the, the end user feels comfortable with as far as engaging us. I think the timing of this is good because our government technology is under threat. And quite frankly, it's under siege in many areas. Uh, you've heard of the, the ransomware and those type of things for, for communities that did very hard because they've been found to be vulnerable. I think the, the ability to have a professional come in, whereas before we relied on a volunteer, and I'm not criticizing that because that person's helped out, but we, we think we're at a point where we need to go that next step. Offsite, uh, offsite backup is, is critical. Right now, we, we have a, a, an online, we have a cloud data storage system for you know, our records management system, but we also basically run backups in our uh, And our meaning is we need to get that offsite. That's part of this proposal, too, when I'm going to storage standpoint. So I think it offers some pluses in that, too. Will the, uh, so will you be doing or performing monthly patching on workstations for all systems here at the city? Yes. Okay, and how do you handle the mediation for that? Do you all go ahead and apply the patches at that point? Do you allow the patches to go in uh, a week or two later? How are you right. monitoring those on an ongoing basis? Sure, so we have to, we basically test a lot of it as far as the patches, like in-house, as far as like the Microsoft patches, I guess that's what you're referring to. We kind of test that so we know that this patches can break stuff a lot. 
Okay, we also patch it for Chrome, Firefox, Chrome, yeah, all, third party. Yes, all, all those products, mm -hmm. Adobe, Java, and everything? Yes, sir. Okay. What about the firewall? Does the firewall reside here or does it reside at your place? Uh, uh, my understanding the firewall is here. The firewall is here. Yes, sir. Are you receiving the logs from the firewall to a SIM or are you all monitoring that SIM or monitoring the logs to the SIM anyway? anyway? We, we, will, we will assess that um, basically internally. Uh, we, we do have a third party um, cybersecurity firm if they want it to monitor by a SOC, but that's not a part of this deal right here. How do we get that to be a part of this cost? Yes. Because that's where, that's where the work. Sure. That's I mean, where we the catch is right there because we're running a website internal. So mm -hmm. are we doing, the, the website's internal, right? No, the website's external. External? The website is, yeah, the website and is the cloud. Yes. Okay. And are they doing DDoS on the cloud? Or do we yeah, no, 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 no. Okay, so they should be doing some kind of DDoS on, on the website to make sure, because we're taking payments over that website, right? So I would expect them to be doing that. Yes. That'll be a different conversation. But we haven't talked about the website. We've just talked about the network here a little bit. I would be interested in whether or not the logs are going that are going to the cell, what that would cost to monitor that, because that's where I think we're going to get caught. Sure, and I mean that's where we bolt on those types of services left all day. We can do that. We just haven't put that into this proposal. Okay. I, I'm good with what you're doing. I just would like to know what that next step is. Sure. That's, that, that's going to be our next catch. Yeah, it's just a matter of cost. Um, most people, I mean, they, I mean, they ask for those types of things all the time, um, and we could totally do those things. It's just a matter of budgets. Maybe you can have third party monitoring. Too. Yes, sir. Any other questions, please? I have a question for Don. Sure. Uh, Don, I'm not going to go into the Java and the switches <coughs> and Chrome and all that, but did we get more than one vendor uh, code for this? We called around, we called around several folks. How many? Did we get written requests that you could present talk, to us? Talk through. Talk through, and, and, and quite frankly, we were looking at reputation first and reliability first, and then we started talking pricing. <coughs> One of the things that this company brings that I think is also a plus is our NDT system and the police department, which goes in all of our patrol cars. They have experience with that software provider, uh, which is somewhat of a specialized. Now, what's the net increase in expenses? In other words, when we take out the previous guy, we have to send him, what, what, what's our net increase? It's a 100% increase. It's the uh, other guy was volunteer. He was strictly <coughs> volunteer. We occasionally, we would occasionally <coughs> pay for something, but uh, yeah. yeah, they're 100% increase. You're staring at it. <laughs> Any other questions, please? Can you work on apples? Um, we do have guys that, that can. That's not our specialty, just to be honest. Most folks are, unless you're marketing or printing professionals, those are probably in our education. We do have some guys that are skilled in that area. Thank you. Sure. If there are any more questions, please, I'll entertain a motion. Second. Second. Discussion. So I have a question. As as the as we grow, the department grows, the village grows, and we add more units, so to speak, is it does that increase in price? To yes. every every computer we add, we're gonna just increase the Yes, and then if you decrease it it goes down. Okay. That's how the model does. So it's not based on like um it's, it's based on at every single unit, not like, you know, zero to four and four to ten, and you know, like a, a range. Right. Okay. That's good. So what's the date of implementation? Start date. Start date would be immediately upon approval. Uh, tomorrow. We would coordinate and get it going, but 
we don't want to waste the day. So where I'm going with this is, where are we going to find the funding for the rest of the year? You have that money in your budget. You have that money in your fund balance. What's the cost every time? If you need to, you might have excess and unspent money by the end of the year. Yes, ma'am. What's the cost every time there's an increase? Uh, it increments the, um, like say, in the first line where it says computers or servers, just increments by those numbers for that month. Other discussion, other questions, please? Yeah, no, I, I, I'd like to see two or three vendor quotes on an activity like this in the future, you know, just to show that we've done our homework on this. Yeah, we, we do. And in, in this situation, we didn't have written, we got we got a final written proposal after we got through discussions with Absolutely, that's normal practice. Okay. And just so you know, I've heard a number, couple of numbers bounced around. It's fifteen thousand dollars a year, not sixteen and not twenty-one. Fifteen five ten plus five. Yeah, start at absolutely sixteen. That's right. Where coming from. So that's just higher twenty-one. Okay. Any other discussion, please? Uh, I got one final question. Reading of the proposal here shows after hours support one hundred eighty-seven fifty per hour. That's above and beyond what we're going to pay you. Yes. Yes. I'll say that hardly ever happens, though, even because we support a bunch of, you know, we have, you know, uh, ER facilities that never close, police departments never close. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, we only get calls on that if somebody is like the whole system is down. Um, but if most of the time, on any kind of stuff like that, it, it can generally wait till the next day. We generally would call, if somebody called us, we would get some sort of manager approval before we um, would come out. But we will help. We have a on call service that basically goes 24 7 for entities like, like I mentioned. Where I would see that potentially coming to use is if they have to come in and work on a weekend or something to do some type of network rebuild or expansion or something along those lines. That's more than what we the extra hours. <laughs> You have an instant response program in place to handle ransomware. Yes, sir. Other questions of the discussion, please. Do I hear the call for the question? Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Opposed, likewise. Passes. We're going to go back to B now. Discuss and consider possible action authorizing the village administrator to seek bids for the acquisition and installation of an odor control system for the Royal Street lift station. Yes, sir. Uh, Mayor, members of the board, uh, we've talked about this several times during the administrator's reports. Uh, we installed two lift stations with our a new wastewater system, one on Church Street and the one on Royal Street. Uh, both of those were designed and properly designed and are functioning as designed right now, despite what some of the social media may like to spew. Uh, they were designed as basic lift stations. At the time they were designed, the decision was made not to include any additional uh, odor control. They wanted to see what the situation would be like first and then make that decision whether to spend the excess dollars. Uh, we have not received any complaints on Church Street. Uh, but we have received some complaints on Royal Street. Uh, it's a periodic odor issue. It's not a consistent odor issue. We monitor it on a regular basis. We have put charcoal hoods on that system uh, to try to address it. Uh, it has not completely addressed the problem. Uh, we still get complaints. And so as such, uh, the discussions have taken place about the idea of, of taking that next step. The next step being to actually go and, and, and install a true odor control system uh, on, that, uh, on that lift station itself. It's a, it's a self-contained system that, that needs to be manufactured and would be installed on site. Uh, that should uh, go a long way if not completely eliminate the odors. I'm not gonna say completely eliminate because then people are gonna think once it happens, it's failed. It, it should go a long, hard part of getting rid of uh, the issue as far as odors go. Uh, it's an expensive system. Uh, the estimates that we've received in, in looking at it uh, are somewhere in the neighborhood of anywhere from 100 to $140,000 depending on the system that uh, we end up specking and, and we end up getting a bid. It's a system that's going to take some time to manufacture, uh, so it'll be a couple of months uh, to, to probably see a delivery. Uh, but it's a system that we think will go a long way towards addressing uh, the, the limited odor issue we encounter at that particular lift station. Uh, I know there's a lot of concern about the location of that lift station. 
uh, to relocate that lift station would be significantly more than this amount. Uh, I will tell you, Alderman Cogner and I have been working with the folks who, who have concerns about the odor down there right now, uh, and, and we've walked through this and talked through this issue. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you want to add anything to, to what we've talked about. <coughs> sure, but uh, when I was down there, the three times that I went by there, the odor is noticeable at this time of the year. And it only gets worse as the, uh, as it heats up. So it is, it is an issue. It's, uh, we've done the uh, businesses down in that area a, uh, a bad uh, service and uh, put that uh, uh, lift station at that location. And I think we have a responsibility to uh, take ownership and get that resolved. Should we proceed and, and get the bids and then go to acquisition and we're in that ballpark budget wise and you authorize the expenditure, the question is who, how do we fund that? Does it come out of the general fund? No. Uh, that would come out of bond funds. It's, it's an improvement to the system. Uh, so we would use uh, some of the remaining bond money we have uh, to go towards that particular, particular purchase. We have about 800000 uh, $700,000, $800,000 left in that bond fund uh, now that the system's built. Uh, so we would have plenty of money to cover that cost if we needed. Other questions? Was this ever, ever mentioned by our engineer? You know, yeah, and it, it, it's mentioned in the design process. The, the, the lift station's properly designed. Uh, you know, the discussions that took place regarding that design were before my time in large part. Uh, and, and the discussion, I've even asked the question in, in the final stages. And the question was, you know, we could always come back in and put something in, you know, should that time be. Spend the 100000 now, spend the 100000 later, you know, those type of things. Uh, so. I believe it is yes, it probably was discussed in the past, not having been here. Uh, but I will tell you, there are people out there that contend this is a flaw in design. There are people out there that contend the engineer is responsible for this cost. And, and that's just not the case. The decision was made at the time the system was built to, to build it without that particular system in place. And so now you're at a point of having to make a decision on whether you want to add it because we have concerns about odor at that point. So is there a design cost? Or is it simply $100,000 is the actual cost of the? That's the that's, that's construction piece. And, and, and what you'll do is you'll spec it and we'll bid it and see what we come up with. Uh, we've, looked at, we've looked at a couple of units. Again, our goal is always to go out and seek multiple proposals. Uh, and we've looked at a couple of units and what we'll do is we'll issue specs. We don't think there's a, you know, the, the ones we've looked at are, are, are not sole source items. Uh, so they're competitively bid items. So we need a competitive bidding to see how good a price we can get. It will not require any additional space, any additional outward extension of the lift station footprint. Uh, it's all self-contained and would be behind the fence. Any other questions, please? I'll entertain a motion. Move to move forward seeking bids. Motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. Discussion? Question, Question has been called. All in favor, raise your hand, please. Proposed likewise passes. Our final piece of business tonight discuss and consider possible action regarding plans for the queue on. Main barbecue cook off on Saturday, May 2nd, 2020. Mayor, it's that time of the year again. It's barbecue time in downtown Salado, and it's going to be on May the 2nd. And we're pleased to have members of the Rotary Club here, bow tie and smiling faces included, and they've survived. And we'll turn it over to Dan and Tony. Thank you. Hi, my name's Kenny Kalarik, and this is, as he mentioned, Deanna Whitson here on behalf of the Salado Rotary Club. Uh, seeking, creating awareness, but also seeking approval for us to hold our third annual Q on Main event. Uh, basically what we do, we, we take uh, registrations from approximately 12 to 20 barbecue cook-off teams. We spread them throughout the village trying to create awareness and trying to also create some retail traffic from some of our shop owners. Uh, those uh, actually, they're actually competing against each other. It's, it's a friendly competition, uh, but they also, uh, are, they also give uh, their food away to, to the public. Uh, we've actually used this as a fundraiser. 
Uh, we sell approximately between 250 to 300 admissions, and we use it as a fundraiser for the Slater Rotary Club, also uh, to be able to fund some of the things that we do and support the community as well. Um, we are aware of Main Street construction items that are going on. We're aware of, aware of COVID-19 as well, um, but we make no representation uh, to our to our cooks at this time about where they'll be located or how this will be executed. So we can defer decisions on that to later on that. Questions, please. I'll entertain a motion, please. Motion we approve the minutes. Yes, sir. Second. Second. Do I hear the call for question? Question. All in favor, raise your hand. Most likewise. Uh, well, we save the best for last, obviously. And then, uh, second of all, we'd like to say it on behalf of the Rotary Club to the young man. We are going to be donating $100, as well as your Texas uh, Commissioner Precinct 2, Bobby Whitson, will be also donating $100 to you as well. So, congratulations. Mm -hmm. Very well. Sir, could I, I really like the way you, you dress tonight. Could I wear that Sunday? Okay, thank you. I, never, I really I like that. That's good. Mayor, you never believe he's a high school football player. Really? Well, he's a man of distinction, I'll tell you that. Okay, I have a motion for adjournment. Is there a second? Let's go home.